We have been doing uh, stories from the Old Testament. Uh, we have followed Moses and the uh, Israelites from their captivity in uh, Egypt out into the desert where they are they're exploring who God is at this time. Uh, we often think of uh, the Israelites as people that uh, just always knew who God was and that, uh, you know, it was just kind of a given. You have to remember that this, is, this time has passed from the time of uh, Abraham, when Abraham was first introduced to God as the, uh, the, the word here is monotheistic. That means one God. Before this introduction of God, everyone thought of gods, plural. They thought of angry beings. They thought of uh, people that uh, creation uh, out of um, uh, explosion and wars and rage and all of this kind of stuff. And gods were something that you feared or something that uh, worked as a puppet master for you. Um, this is an entire culture shift. And so they were just starting to understand this when they were all captive in Egypt in a culture where those several gods were all around and everything like that were all around again. And so their ideas of who God is has been diluted and polluted over time. They've kind of lost their way a little bit. And God is in the desert now reintroducing himself, herself to these Israelites. And part of that time in the desert spent is where we hear the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, I'm praying... That when we talk about the Ten Commandments, we are hearing something a little bit different. We're hearing a little bit of a different take on them. Because for so many years, we have, uh, many of us, if you're like me, have grown up with these Ten Commandments, and they've almost been a list of scoldings, a list of uh, things where people have to stay in line. Uh, and we've often uh, been raised in conditions where we have felt that God was somebody that was out to get us, or somebody that was standing there like this all the time uh, with judgment on us. And we are waiting just to mess up and just to disappoint God for another day. I'm hoping that we are learning that these Ten Commandments are introductions, that they are ways that God is saying, uh, let me introduce myself to you. Uh, these commandments are things that will help carry the message of who I am through generation to generation and not let it be diluted into something or morphed into something. Sadly, uh, in many ways, uh, we continue to morph who God is, and we continue to misrepresent. And so if you have just joined us, I invite you to go back and look at uh, the previous commandments that we're talking about. We've already covered three of them, no other gods before me, no graven images or likenesses, and don't make wrongful use of my name. And I, and I pray that we have seen these in a different light than, than what we have before, and I pray that we continue as we go into the, the ten uh, commandments. Before we get started on this commandment, the first thing I want to ask you is, does anybody know what an Easter egg is when it comes to like movies? I knew you would, Derek. I knew you, I knew you would. Um, for those of you that don't, creators of uh, movies uh, for quite a few years now love to put in little things, like it's something in the background or something in the thing that is either a nod to their fans a nod to the community or the body of work that they have made. In some cases, it's even something that uh, gives a future nod to something. Um, I, I see a lot of furrowed brows here. Uh, let's take a look at like the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, this was created by George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. Uh, George Lucas, of course, is the creator of the Star Wars world. And so uh, you, I've watched this for many years, uh, and I, I'm sure... It's older than Cindy Lauper's song was that we talked about earlier. But um, a lot of people saw this scene and they never saw in the hieroglyphics R2-D2 and C-3PO. That is something where George Lucas and Steven Spielberg stepped outside of the norm and just gave a little nod to who their community was. And so just by doing that little Easter egg, the people that knew George Lucas and Steven Spielberg and all that stuff, somehow the community kind of expanded itself and came together. Everything connected. Even though that this story has nothing to do with Star Wars, it made people feel connected with a, with a larger picture. Uh, and like I said, sometimes those Easter eggs can actually give us a taste of the future. 
2001, a movie called Monsters, Inc. introduced us, just a nod, to Nemo, who would not be heard of or seen until 2003. Pixar is very famous for doing this. They have a reputation of, if you see something in, the, in the, the background or a little small nod, they are actually prophesying a future film that's going to take place, and it could be years from now, but something that they are working on, they will give a little nod that this is going to happen in the future. Isn't that kind of amazing that they can do that? Uh, and it goes without being seen. So, and so sometimes when people like Pixar fans, they'll watch something and they go, they'll have to go back at the older movies to see if there's a reference to it and to see what sign of what we didn't understand at the time now makes sense now. Why am I talking about this? Because there's an Easter egg in this commandment that I'm going to share with you. And I hope that we can spot it. Um, it's not going to be C-3PO, so there's no Star Wars reference. I just want you to let you know. Hate to disappoint, yes. Um, we, uh, the, the, the commandment, uh, Moses is in the, the desert. He's on the mountain. He's talking to God. God is giving him these instructions. Here's the commandment. From Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath for the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident, alien for, is a foreign person, uh, from, uh, <laughs> not, again, not Star Wars, uh, or alien residents in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. This is another example of God wanting to create a relationship with us. The, everything that we read in the Bible, everything that the stories tell is about God trying to create a relationship with us. We, as, as people... We can, we can say, I, I love God, you know, and uh, if you ever say that in Walmart, they'll look at you weird and all that kind of stuff, but um, we'll say that, but then we can easily get distracted, and we can easily, you know, get, start seeing uh, things in our lives and all that kind of stuff, and we can actually start worrying about stuff and have anxiety, and we can have anger, we can have prejudice, all kinds of fears and happiness and all of this kind of stuff, and we can totally lose concept of who God is and everything like that. We can totally get so caught up in the things of the here and now and in our real world that we forget that there is a creator of that world that wants to have a relationship with us. In some cases, it's like, I used to be a, 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 a family photographer. I used to work for a company, this is many years ago, uh, called Olin Mills, and I was a family photographer. Yes, I was the guy that took you and sat you in the chair uh, like this and took pictures of it. That's, that's pose number one, you know? And usually there'd be like a fake library because you wanted to look smart, or there was a fake fireplace that, you know, and... We would, we would pose families together, and so there'd be, you know, you'd, you'd have there, and it was usually, you know, uh, one of the parents would hold the infant child. The parents and the elder kids, they would be able to say, you know, I would be here, you know, with the, the, um, the remote to the camera, and I would say, just, just look at me, you know, and everybody would be looking at me except that infant child. That infant child would be looking at anything else. I had stuffed animals. I, I was telling Derek, I, I had a stuffed penguin that was like my favorite, you know. Uh, it was something about the black and white uh, image. The kids responded to it well, and so I would try to shake that, you know. And you would have the parents all ready, and the child every once in a while would gaze at that penguin. But if something happened like a chair did, doing nothing, the child would focus on that chair or focus on the wall or the carpet or anything, and it would take what would seem like days to try to get one child to focus. I remember one time, 
This is long ago. They don't remember who I am. I was trying to get the child to focus, and they had this, this, this family, and it had grandparents, and it was this big family. So it was really important that everybody else stay focused on me, you know? So everybody, uh, there's like 14 of them are watching this penguin, and they're staying focused on it, and the child is looking everywhere, and I'm dancing, I am singing, I'm doing all kinds of stuff. Finally, the child looks at me and even smiles, and I click it. And when the prince come back, the grandfather holding the child is picking his nose. <laughs> so, it's just, you know, uh, I kept it for many years, actually. I, I, that was right on my uh, desk wall there. But sometimes God is doing the same thing for us. He is trying so desperately to get our attention. And we, like the infant child, are looking at everything that life has. We're looking at politics. We're looking at all these kind of stuff, jobs, all this, the things of our daily lives, the people that upset us in traffic, stores, money, all of that kind of stuff. And in the meantime, God is waving at us and saying, hey, I'm with you. I'm here. Just I'm, I'm, I want a relationship with you. And so the Sabbath was created because God wanted us to at least take one day and remember that we're loved by God. That's what the Sabbath was all about. It was about uh, pausing in that busyness and focus one day on God. And something amazing about this is because before that this was ever given, you know, the whole, the whole Old Testament, uh, there wasn't any concept of a seven-day week. That was never a thing. This invented the seven-day week. The whole idea of a monotheistic God, one God, the idea of seven-day week, the idea of taking a day off, all of this is new to people because of the stories that we read in the Old Testament. This is where it was created. We have a seven-day work week now because of this. Otherwise, it was just people were just wandering around and it was day. What day is it? What are you talking about? I have no idea. So the, the very concept of these kind of things, this is why it has taken so many years for us to get certain things. Because we're talking about a change of behavior. We're talking about a change of culture. We're talking about a change of instinct. To learn that there are numbered days, to learn that there is a day to take off, to learn in thousands of years when people were worshiping thousands of different gods that there was just one is unheard of. The, 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 the Israelites, I mean, when they would go to Egypt and they would tell people that they believe in a God, they'd say, how many gods do you believe in? Which God for this? Which God for this? And when the Israelites would say, we believe in one God, it blew people's minds. They didn't know what was, they thought they were nuts. One God? Really? It baffled them. And so we are seeing an entire culture change. And we still see that today. People are still trying to figure out this, who God is. And we're still trying to figure out the commandment of the Sabbath. Because when you hear the Sabbath, when you hear that commandment, the thing that you think of is God wants you to take a day off. That's the day to go to the ball game. That's the day to do this. That's the day to pause. That's the day to just relax, kick your feet up, and say, I deserve this. And in some cases, that's what it is. In some cases, that's exactly what it is. It's God saying, the Sabbath is a time you work all of this time, six days a week. Take a day and pause. But what God is also saying is during that day, hang out with me for a little bit. And that's where church came from. The Hebrews not only created the seven-day week, they created church. Throughout the Hebrew uh, tradition, the Sabbath was a day that people connected, were meant to connect with God. And that's why they went to uh, synagogue and the temple and all of that kind of stuff. They developed uh, routines where they would sing psalms. They would share the stories. They would have somebody come up, um, no taller than me. They would have somebody come up and, and help interpret Scripture and, and talk about things and teach lessons. And then they would sing and they would have community and they would have meals. We're still doing that because we're supposed to. 
A church is something that has become a political movement. It has become something of, of, of hatred. It has become something, something of bells and whistles. What, this, what church is really meant to be is that Sabbath of where we come together and we pause and we recognize that we have a God that loves us, that we have a God that wants to be in our life, that we have a God that wants to just share with us. If, you have, if you're a parent of an adult child, uh, sometimes you feel the same way. You know that you get that maybe call once a week. You know, you just want to connect with them. You want to see how they're doing. And when, when that text or call shows up on your phone, you're thrilled. You know, you want to hear from them. You, I, I had lunch with my son just last week, and we got to, to catch up. I hadn't had lunch with him since COVID, and so it was beautiful to see him again. Uh, that's what God wants once a week. He's hoping that the, by having a relationship with us once a week, you will feel in the kingdom of heaven. You'll feel part of that. And then when we go out into the other six days, we take a little bit of that with us and we spend some time with God. It's about God creating that relationship with us. Now, did anyone notice the Easter egg? I'm going to pull a Pixar here. Pixar, as we said, they would create things in the past that gave a message to the future. This is it. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. The time that this was written, people had slaves. Sadly, at the time I'm giving this sermon, people have slaves. Slavery is something that still exists. People are still oppressed. People are still abused. People are still considered outsiders because of the town or city or climate or country that they were happened just to be born in. We are still creating boundaries in our world as they did then. It's appalling. Uh, the fact that even the Hebrew people that were slaves in Egypt at the time that this is being written have slaves themselves. It's appalling. It's appalling the fact that we consider people that grow up, grew up in a different environment as alien, foreigner, them, not us. That's the environment that this scene took place. The Easter egg is that God is sending a message to us now. And that message is the Sabbath. Remember I said the Sabbath is not just a day off, it's a day about being with God in the presence of God. The message that God is sending back then to us now is that when you're in the presence of, my, of me, everybody matters. Everybody is in the presence of me. My time where you get to experience God means that that time is experienced with every single person and animal on the planet. Every single being on this planet is loved by God. That's the message he's trying to teach them so long ago. In a world where they don't even understand for sure what a one God is or what a seven-day week is, he is planting seeds of everybody matters. People are not to be oppressed in this world. People are not to be slaves in this world. So when you come to my house, everybody comes to my house. When you spend that one day a week with me, everybody spends that day with me. When you come here, you are equal with every single person, planet, living being on this world. When you come and experience God and want to experience what the kingdom of heaven is, you're going to see people that have been oppressed, that have been enslaved, that have been uh, 
kicked out, that have been felt like outsiders all of their lives. You're going to see them celebrating an experience of love with God. And we're going to see that story grow, and we're going to see it come to a place where there's this person named Jesus Christ who is having a relationship with everybody. He's still living in a culture of slavery. He's still living in a culture of repression. But his actions are one where he allows everybody into his kingdom. It has evolved so much to where when they heard son, daughter, when they heard slave, female, when they heard all of this stuff, it didn't bat, a, bat an eye. Thank God, this day and age, it does. Thank God we read stuff like that and we say, that turns my stomach. To even hear the acceptance of slavery or the repression of people or the treatment of people that are outside of our community, that turns my stomach. Because it's supposed to. Because that's the Easter egg. That's the nugget of information that we are supposed to grow and evolve and take with us into today. And thank God, that's why on this Sabbath, when we celebrate in this church, every, everybody is welcome here. Everybody is celebrated here. Everybody is loved here. Because we learned from an Easter egg far away. The question I have is what is the Easter egg that we're planting here and now that when people come and experience this, what's the message that we're giving them in their future? What's the message we're giving our children? Question I have for you. We're going to take about 20 seconds. Will's going to play a, a, a little bit of music, and we're just going to think about this. How do you observe the Sabbath? If it means more than just a day off now, if it is about welcoming people, if it is about um, sharing the experience of God with every single person in the, in the world, how do we observe it? Let's think on that for about 20 seconds and then Will's going to favor us with a song. The Sabbath is meant for a pause. It's meant for a time that we share with God. It's meant to be a time that we are reminded of how welcome we are in the presence of God. We live in a world today where people still ask the question, is the Sabbath for me too? Look them in the eye and say, yep. God's presence, God's love is for all of us. I hope we're spending our Sabbath reminding others of that, of the love of God, of ways we can learn to love ourselves and the way we can love our neighbor, every single one of us. Amen.